Welcome to Risky Talk, the podcast where we talk about risk and how to talk about risk. In this episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Tamsin Edwards all about confronting uncertainty as a climate scientist, as a communicator, but also as an individual in her personal life. This is a more intimate episode than usual, and we weave together some different threads. We cover how Tamsin has dealt with communicating uncertainty in climate science and how she found listening to the perspective of the audience, including those who are deeply sceptical about climate change, very important in learning how to communicate. But we also explore Tamsin's personal experience after a medical diagnosis forced her to confront serious but uncertain risks to her health. Tamsin, Welcome to Risky Talk. Hi, it's lovely to be here. Now, you and I are both uncertainty nerds. People often think that science delivers cold, hard facts that everyone agrees with. But what place does uncertainty have in your work? I think the best way uh, I've heard it put is that uncertainty is the engine of science. It, the, the, we couldn't do science if we if we knew it. That, that's the point. You know, it's the it's the idea that we are at the bounds of knowledge is is both why we need to do the science and what's exciting about it. And I got interested in uncertainty, kind of right from the start of when I went into climate modelling. Actually, through joining a project uh, which had a statistician involved, which was perhaps relatively unusual at that time. Um, a mutual friend of ours called John T. Rouger. And, um, and I just got, I got kind of bitten by the bug, really, of uncertainty, of, of exploring possibilities, of being kind of open to not just thinking about the, the things that we didn't know, but trying to anticipate the things that might happen that we haven't yet, you know, the unknown unknowns and all of that. Yeah. Um, and, and the almost kind of philosophical aspect of trying to predict the future when we have all that uncertainty in, in how something behaves in something as complicated as the planet with a relatively limited amount of data to sort of base it on. And there's always going to be kind of limits to our knowledge. So, I, yeah, I just really kind of fell in love with the subject. Yeah, you specialise in developing models for climate systems. Your blog is called All Models Are Wrong. Okay, <laughs> why, why did you call it that? Well, some people may know there's a, a famous um, quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful by the statistician George Box. It's got its own Wikipedia page. Oh, it has its own Wikipedia page. So I, I stole it from that. And um, it came about, actually, I was always interested in that quote, and I was already working in the idea of uncertainty. But it came about through some Twitter conversations, actually, about how one should communicate climate science, I guess, to the public and climate prediction. And that there was this kind of split view around the idea of kind of trying to increase confidence in climate predictions by emphasizing all the things we were really certain about and the really the stuff we were really sure about. You know, there's um, there's all this kind of very hardcore, well-known, well-established physics at the, at the core of these big climate models and emphasizing all the ways in which we think very carefully about the models and we test them and we you know put lots of work into that versus the the risks of doing that too comprehensively and saying we were sure to the point of absolute certainty um, and and de-emphasizing scientific uncertainty and, and what dangers that can lead to in terms of uh, when the evidence base does change, when our understanding changes, um, when we have different predictions coming out in the media that might appear to be contradictory uh, when we understand and, and discover something new – that we then put ourselves at risk of saying, ah, but we thought you were sure about that, but now you've changed your mind. And actually, I, as well as being interested in uncertainty for my research, I'm a firm believer in communicating the idea of uncertainty in, in cutting-edge research to the public to try and help resolve some of those difficulties around apparently contradicting and changing evidence, because evidence is apparently contradictory and changing because that's the nature of of uncertain knowledge. In a previous podcast we did on climate change, um, one of our guests, Antti Lazovitz, said that there's a double standard, that somehow people or politicians might expect us to be so certain about things like climate change. And yet when you think about policies like Brexit or anything like that, actually there are huge uncertainties. And everyone seems 
to be able to accept those. What do you feel about that? Absolutely. I mean, obviously, we're always making decisions under uncertainty, but I, I don't know how much I've seen um, people really saying you need to narrow your error bars on a prediction, something as explicit about uncertainty as that. It kind of runs much more deeply, I think, than that. It's much more about the fundamental kind of tenets of what you're saying. It's not about, oh, well, wait, wait until you can predict global mean temperature in the year 2100 to within 0.1 degrees Celsius as opposed to, you know, 1.4 degrees Celsius. It's, it's much more about, well, the assumptions that go into that and the testing and the um, potential for uh, groupthink and cognitive biases. So I don't normally see it expressed as reduce your uncertainty. It's much more kind of fundamental than that. So uh, it's not a match, matter of the width of the error bars. It's more people thinking, do you even know what you're talking about? Yeah, do you even know what you're talking about? Or are you lying with some agenda? Are you manipulating the results in some way? This kind of thing. And yeah, so and so the kinds of questions I, I get asked, I guess, when I give a climate talk from people who kind of lean a bit sceptical or, or get asked on Twitter, isn't sort of, oh, well, your your prediction isn't credible until you've halved your error bars. It's about, well, have you forgotten that this other thing might drive climate? Or um, have you added some bias correction to the data that has made it, you know, systematically wrong? That kind of thing. Yeah. So it's it's to do with systematic errors due to not including an important factor or just your model being wrong, which, as you said, all models are wrong. Exactly. And I, and that's what I really wanted with the blog name and the blog theme as well, the, you know, being about uncertainty to kind of confront that head on. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really... It was partly about how do we come up with the error bars, because that's kind of interesting and useful to talk about. But also it was about how do we test those assumptions? How do we evaluate our models? How do we incorporate knowledge and check for systematic biases, uh, groupthink, this kind of thing? And really actually say, look, I want to talk about uncertainty and I want to examine the thought processes and I want to lay it all out in the open so that we can have a conversation about uh, you know, to make it transparent about how these decisions are made, about which things we're more confident about and, and have been sort of tested very thoroughly and which things are more difficult because there isn't the data or we don't have such good understanding. OK, can I ask you a more general question? What, what do you think at the moment with the way that all the discussions going on about COVID, about which there's quite a lot of you know basic disagreement about what should be done and so on, and there are, is a highly sceptical movement as well. Uh, do you think that you know, the uncertainty about the science is being communicated well or not? I think it's been good that the UK government have sort of, you know, been placing chief scientific and medical officers in the briefings public facing every day and been trying to sort of include some of that quantitative data on the predictions. And they've been trying to make it clear that the mortality rates don't include everything and have some time lag. So there's there's definitely probably better efforts to, to make things clear than I feared there could be. But at the same time, there's a lot of things that I think are not very clear. Lots of people seem to be very surprised about the time scale likely for these lockdowns. This idea that we, we'd have a review every three weeks, that people are kind of getting their hopes up um, about the lockdown stopping every three weeks. But when I had a look at the original Imperial report uh, by Neil Ferguson and others, it was very clear that, you know, the assumptions in those initial predictions that drove, as I understand it, that initial lockdown were sort of, you know, several months for the first lockdown, followed by a lifting, followed by another lockdown, followed by a short lift, by followed by another lockdown. And this would go in and out of um, lockdown based on the intensive care capacity for perhaps two years uh, with a majority of the time in lockdown. So that seems to me a really key piece of information that hasn't been communicated. And it's not that that's a policy, but it's it's obviously part of the evidence base that has gone into the policy. Exactly. And, and I, I do feel that the, um, you know, the critique, the public discussion about all these things has, has not been that great, to be honest. And the journalists, you know, seem to be more, much more concerned with blaming people rather than actually looking at, examining what people are saying and critiquing the data and the assumptions being made and so on. It's, it's quite similar, actually. There's a, there's a parallel in climate science. Isn't it? Well, for a start, the fact that predictions do get revised as we get more evidence and more data in. So that's not sort of flip flopping or some kind of weakness. That's a good thing. You know, we, we should be changing our 
our predictions as as new data comes in. But also, that particularly with it's sort of relevant to climate science, the difference between, um, I guess, a, a scenario of a particular policy intervention versus a sort of uncertainty range for a particular policy intervention or a particular model or a particular study. So what I mean by that is that the original imperial study had the sort of predictions for no policy at all versus a sort of, you know, suppression versus a sort of full lockdown. And those were very different numbers. But they would sometimes get communicated as, well, they can't make up their mind if it's this number or that number. Or another study would come along with a different number and they'd say, well, you know, th- these people can't make up their minds, but they were comparing two different scenarios. So I think there's a subtlety around that, that idea of making predictions under particular yeah. situations. The, the, I, I agree that there's a difficulty in communicating sort of conditional predictions. People exactly. say, oh, that's your prediction of what's going to happen. No, that's a prediction were this to be the case. And exactly. Something that, that within science, we're so used to talking about these conditional scenarios, what ifs, and which when it turns into communication, it becomes that's the prediction. It happened recently with the Office of Budget Responsibility making the dire, you know, fork, and it wasn't a fork, it was a scenario for the possible economic harms of the lockdown. And they explicitly said this is not a prediction. And everybody said that's what their predict is going to happen. Absolutely. And it's about partitioning the uncertainty, isn't it? I mean, in climate change, the equivalence is the um, the scenarios of different greenhouse gas emissions in the future. And concentrations. So we, you know, as climate scientists, we cannot predict what the future policies will be over the next century. So we make predictions for the high uh, greenhouse gas emissions for the medium and the low, con- you know, conditional on those emissions. And that's because we can't, you know, we can't, we can't predict those uncertain parts of the system. But w- what we can do is try and predict how the physical system of the planet and the atmosphere and the oceans will respond to a given scenario. But again, people will say, how, how can you how can you predict what people will do or what emissions will be? Uh, but it's a different thing. So, so I mean, that's what we're really concerned with here is the communication. And you're one of the lead authors of the next intergovernmental panel on climate change, IPCC report, which re- receives extraordinary attention. Um, what's the point of the report? And how well do you think they have communicated their work, particularly in terms of the uncertainties, the possible scenarios, and so on? The... IPCC assessment reports um, started in 1990 to really gather the evidence base for you know, the world's policymakers to think about climate change. And every sort of five to seven to sort of eight years, we've had new assessment reports. And the next one is going to be the sixth assessment report. And these things are now enormous, dense volumes of information. And they don't even capture every part of climate science. They're just really a sample of the key changes and they try to explain and contextualize, you know, what we've learned and, and what different, uh, what the impact of different policy interventions would be on climate change. The idea is to be policy relevant, not policy prescriptive, is the phrase. So they present the, the predicted climate change under different greenhouse gas emissions. And But it, there's, inter- there's an interesting kind of change in how we've thought about those predictions in recent years because of the... Paris Agreement, uh, setting things up in terms of a temperature target. So we often used to think about um, greenhouse gas emissions or concentrations particularly as a limit. We've got to keep to 550 parts per million of CO2, something like this. And you may notice that we don't really think in those terms anymore. We think much more in terms of the two, a probability of keeping to the two degrees warming or the one and a half degrees of warming since pre-industrial. And of course, that's a different way of thinking about it. You have to map out all the possible ways in which you could limit greenhouse gas emissions in a way that would then lead to only two degrees of warming or less, or say a two-thirds probability of that, not even a a 100% probability, but say a two-thirds probability. So actually, instead of thinking of a forward direction of if we have high or low greenhouse gas emissions, what would the temperature be? The new reports, the special report on one and a half degrees uh, of warming was a lot more about what would greenhouse gas emissions need to be to maintain a warming limit of this. Which I suppose does make it relevant to an outcome measure that is the one that people are basically interested in. Well, a very simplified metric, obviously. I mean, global mean temperature is a is a incredibly kind of coarse way of thinking mm. about climate change, but mm. it's a useful sort of 
ballpark metric of change, I guess. It's a summary of, of change that doesn't incorporate everything, but it's a, a scale on which to kind of to, to, to act. Yeah. So um, one of the things that we bring up in every one of these podcasts is, is, you know, what's the purpose of this communicating the science and the uncertainty about the science? Um, and to put it really quite crudely, are you trying to inform people or are you trying to persuade people? of the importance of action or the threat of, uh, you know, uh, facing us all. And um, and I think, you know, it's been claimed within climate science, those two things have sometimes got rather muddied, which one you're trying to do. How do you see that balance? It's a really good question. And I think I have been... I've been involved with the IPCC just for a couple of years, and they are very much, as I say, their sort of almost their hallmark is policy relevant, not poli- policy prescriptive. They are not aiming to persuade. Now, you could argue that some of the communication around some of the recent special reports has been a bit sort of, if we are to you know do X, we must do Y. So that's a sort of that's still a kind of a conditional framing. If we are to meet the Paris Agreement temperature limit of one and a half degrees, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions quickly. If we are to preserve Arctic sea ice or the natural, you know, uh, the the land that we have and the forests around the world, we need to act quickly. So that's still a kind of a conditional, you know, there's an assumption that we want to, you know, keep to the Paris Agreement or that we want to preserve Arctic sea ice or that we want to preserve the world's forests. So I think that's a bit that's a bit more straightforward because there's still a kind of a conditional sort of uh, persuasion if you like and what i have been doing a bit more in recent years is trying to work out how to give scientific advice to activists like extinction and rebellion um whose whose communication goals are not the same as mine i would say in the sense that um I mean, my my own particular goals as a climate scientist are to increase um, public understanding of climate science and and the risks of climate change without advocating particular action. So I I try quite carefully to, again, preface, if we're to keep to the Paris Agreement, it it implies this or requires this. Um, And to make clear that those risks are important and real, and that's why people might want to take action on climate change. Extinction Rebellion, obviously their their aim is is very much to get people out on the streets, to put pressure on politicians. Uh, often they have particular goals like net zero in a particular year, for example, they have as one of their uh, stated aims. Um, and so to that end, they will often emphasise the worst case predictions to kind of gear people up. And they're not really interested in communicating the full range of climate predictions and the full range of uncertainty, but the worst case to motivate action. And I'm not uncomfortable with that as long as they're clear about that. And so that's the advice I try to give them. I try to sort of say, well, it's okay to say X as long as you give some context that this is, you know, really the highest end or... Often, a lot of the things that get passed around uh, the activist sphere are often quite off-the-cuff comments and back-of-the-envelope sort of uh, informal comments made by scientists and sometimes not even scientists, but sort of related people. And again, uh, you know, that's not so bad as long as you make it clear that that's what it is, that it hasn't come from a big peer-reviewed body of evidence by all of climate science. But do you think they listen to you? Uh, I would say it's mixed. I would say some people definitely do right. and some people less so. So I think mm. some people really are, they they don't want to mess it up. They don't want to present science that's wrong because it does damage trust in what they're doing. And it is a problem if they get called out on it. And I have done that. I have you know publicly said when I thought they were wrong and that's not good for them, right? They They want to avoid that situation. But on the other hand, there's always a subjective line between how clearly and transparently they are communicating that additional context, I guess. I mean, you're very special, I think, because you both have engaged with the activists, um, in, in quotes, against climate change, but also you in, have engaged with climate sceptics in a way that I don't think I could um, I'd have the patience to do. <laughs> you know, what's your what's your approach? I, I, you know, I think you've said something that we all would like to know what to say when we meet a sceptic, but you think the better thing is to say, you know, what should you ask a sceptic? 
Yeah. What do, what, what do you mean by that? I think uh, people always say, yeah, how do I persuade climate skeptics or what should I say? And I, you know, the, the quickest way I can condense what I think into, into one sentence is, as you say, is to say, you shouldn't, it's not what you should say, it's what you should ask. You know, wh- where did you get that information from? Why do you think that? Why do you not trust the climate scientists? And it's, and it's, you can learn a lot about, you know, was it some trusted friend? Was it some particular article they read? Was it one particular thing that didn't ring true for them that set them off down that path? And, you know, and, and often by um, the, the sort of second thing I would say is, is very much to make it uh, a bit more nuanced than, well, I am the person with all of the truth and the good information and I'm, let me tell you all of it and dump it on you. And but all actually, the letters after your name. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, exactly. That argument from authority and, mm-hmm. and sort of assuming that everything they say is, is wrong or has mm-hmm. bad, you know, this phrase bad faith motivation. But actually to acknowledge that usually it's much, much more mixed than that. Your typical kind of climate skeptic or contrarian or whatever has a, bu- a bunch of stuff that they are understanding correctly and, 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 and agreeing with you on climate science. And then there are other things that they don't. So it's really important to partition that rather than just to blanket sort of you're wrong, let me tell you how you're wrong. And you, you seem to exemplify something that we've said before on, on, the, on these podcasts, which we always repeat in the Winton Centre, which is the first rule of communication is to shut up and, <laughs> <Yeah>. and, and listen. <laughs> And listen to your audiences. Where are they coming from? Why are they thinking what they're yeah, thinking? Yeah, I'm not always successful, you know, <laughs> on a bad day and I'll be as grumpy as anyone. But um, yeah, I think that's it. And I, I've been trying to think about where that, why that instinct come, comes actually, where it sort of came from. And the, the, the best conclusion I've come from is that my dad was a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. So you follow the good therapist uh, sort of cliche of saying, tell me more. Yeah, well, sort of. And I don't mean that to sound kind of patronising, but it's much more about um, of just thinking, well, everyone has, everyone has a reason for acting the way that they do. And everyone has an internally consistent set of reasons for believing the things that they do. So it's about understanding the root of that and why it diverges from you while trying to hold in your mind the possibility that you might not have the correct way of acting and believing in things. Now, often I would say, you know, as a professional climate scientist who spent many years studying this, I'm not saying I always think that every climate skeptic could be as right as me, but it's about, it's more of a mindset of saying, well, this person, to this person, everything they've read and everything they've understood has entirely confirmed this particular set of beliefs about me and my science. Rather than kind of blunder in and say, well, you're an idiot, <laughs> you know, what's your agenda? Uh, don't be a conspiracy theorist. You know, trying to understand how it is that they can see you in the same way that you are seeing them. I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. Okay. I'd like to make a change of topic, but I don't think it is such a big change because you've discussed really how you bring your your personality and your your humanity into dealing with climate scientists, the uncertainty and the skeptics. And uh, I hope you don't mind me asking about your experience with cancer because that I, it may seem like a, just a massive jump, but uh, to you I don't think it is, and to me it, I don't think it is either because we're dealing here with uncertainty, but on a on a more on a more local personal scale. And uh, so I'd like to ask about that, how, how your, you know, in a way, scientific approach to uncertainty, to acknowledge what we don't know, has um, influenced your approach to uh, the experiences you've had with your disease. Oh, hugely. So um, I, I was uh, diagnosed with bowel cancer just over two years ago, after sort of being ill with kind of serious IBS type symptoms, kind of bowel symptoms, so on. Ended up with kind of emergency surgery, half my colon taken out um, and chemotherapy for six months during kind of most of 2018. And um, two years all clear now, I'm not having any treatment, so that's all good. But um, there are so many interactions with my work and that cancer. And I don't know if it's the same for other scientists and statisticians who have had similar experiences. Statistic risk and probability feels very different when you're at the sharp end of it than when you're trying to talk about it 
in, a, in an abstract way or about a different situation. And of course, that's the problem with climate change, isn't it? The climate change feels very distant. It's a long time in the future. Often the worst people are affected are far away from us. You know, they're in developing countries and so on. And and so when you're at the pointy end of probabilities, <laughs> it, do, it does feel different. And and I found I found loads of interesting things, loads of aspects of it interesting. I found what I, I, I got surprisingly muddled about my own statistics because of sort of chemo brain and fear and um, motivated reasoning of wanting to believe the good statistics and ignore the bad and all of that stuff I suffered. And I was interested to know, to find out that I, I had personal risk thresholds that I thought were acceptable. So, for example, a sort of 10% or less chance of recurrence of the cancer I felt was a sort of manageable feeling. Um, 50-50 was very much not manageable. And, and my own personal probabilities lay kind of ha- sort of somewhere between the two, sort of roughly halfway between the two. Um, and I was... I was also interested in the the way that there was a trade off in in risk of the treatment that I had to sort of incorporate. Um, so there was the the uh, added um, chance of survival through chemotherapy, which was not quite as high as I thought it might be compared with actually the surgery that did most of the work. Just chopping the tumor out did most of the work, and then the chemo was just a bit of a extra bonus on top of that. But of course, the chemo is, is is a very comprehensive poisoning and has its own side effects, of which some can be permanent. And the one that they particularly focus on for my treatment was neuropathy of the permanent nerve damage in your fingers and toes. And the more and it's a cumulative effect. So the more sessions, the more cycles of chemotherapy you take of my kind, the, the more likely that becomes of, of the permanent nerve damage and it can be life-changing it can mean you can't um you're unsteady on your feet or you can't do up buttons or you know it can be quite difficult if you take it for a long time and so trading those probabilities and I remember think I remember really noticing the change in how I felt about those probabilities from the start when my fear was only about my mortality so I thought I'm going to take the full six months no questions asked I don't care what happens to my fingers and toes. Uh, I just want every little 0.1% of survival probability that I can get. By the time I reached towards the sort of maybe four and a half to five months into the chemo when the damage to my fingers was becoming more apparent. And you have to sort of slightly predict it. It's not real time. You know, it's, um, you, it's a trajectory that they have to sort of predict. And as it starts to get worse and you, and you feel the physical sensations of the, the very weird alien changes to your own body and think, well, these are only going to get worse even if I stop the chemo now and they could be permanent uh, or they could certainly last for years. I found myself actually, you know, in tears in the oncologist's office and he said, let's stop that particular treatment. He said, it won't, you know, you've taken most of it. It won't make very much difference to your survival. It could make a big difference to neuropathy. neuropathy and I stopped it. And so that was a change in my my sort of trade-offs, I guess, as I as I went through. Yeah, but I've, I've always tried to be quite open about all this stuff. And so I think it's interesting to draw those parallels as well with, you know, lots of people see risks in climate policy. You know, is it going to affect their quality of life? Is it going to damage the economy? So trying to draw those parallels between the the long term benefits versus potential short term difficulties of, of climate action, I thought was kind of helpful. How I, I ask this both professionally and personally, um, because I, I I don't did you know I had prostate cancer and, and yeah. surgery and radiotherapy, but I haven't had to have chemotherapy, and I think that's the one I really would be starting to think about those trade offs because yeah. um, our Winton Centre we help put the front ends on on risk calculators for women with breast cancer and men with prostate cancer, mm-hmm. in which we give the probabilities of uh, you know increasing your 10-year survival if you have chemotherapy. And we haven't got numbers. We've got numbers on that. We haven't got numbers yet on what the side effects might be, either short-term or long-term. They have to be described much more qualitatively, and people have to make their own trade-off judgments. I don't know if you know, in in, in Cambridge, for example, they, they're quite clear that if there's less than a 3% uh, increase in overall survival at 10 years, they don't recommend chemotherapy. 
Um, you know, so it's got to be fairly, I mean, even if at 5%, they would recommend it. And in between, they would sort of, um, you know, it, it depends very much on the, on the individual. So, you know, it's recognized that you do should demand quite a lot you know, before you would be willing to undergo that. Yeah, there was a similar trial in bowel cancer, actually, the IDEAS trial, big European-wide trial around uh, those trade-offs. And um, they decided that for a lot of sub-stages of bowel cancer, they would only give three months of chemotherapy mm. where there's a very low risk of permanent neuropathy. But I was unfortunately just in the higher risk category, so, I, so they basically recommended the six months. But I think, I do think that uh, it seems, and I, I may be wrong, but it seems as if there isn't always the joined up evidence or the evidence available for that. So, for example, um, so what, the other place I talked about these stories was was on more or less. And um, and actually, my, my main oncologist who had presented with me, presented me with all these statistics also was on the show. And he said it was actually quite unusual to see a patient so long after their treatment had finished and to be able to ask them how is your neuropathy now you know six months or a year after their treatment had finished personally speaking as an oncologist so when he although that evidence may be gathered through other methods still to actually have that opportunity of saying you know how does it feel how how do you feel about your, your neuropathy they don't have the chance because you're out the door as soon as you've had the treatment. You know, they 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 can't take an interest because they have to move on to the next uh, patient. I think. I mean, you and I want these numbers. We would want to see these probabilities, even though, as you said, you know how we read them is hugely influenced about our, our current emotional state and both about the benefit, potential benefits and the potential side effects. And um, do you think this is something that? you know, should be routinely available to patients more, even even those who are not as perhaps so obsessed with these ideas than we are. <laughs> well, well, in my very first uh, session with uh, with my oncologist, he um, he gave me the full PowerPoint that he gives to his medical <laughs> students because he realised quite the level of numbers that I wanted. Um, he, he did stop short of, of emailing me the PowerPoint. He, he said I, I couldn't have a copy. But um, obviously they have to make very quick judgments, don't they, about what information people want and can cope with. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm so pleased to be able to talk to you about this because, um, I, you know, after my experience, I feel enormously motivated to, that that everyone should have this informa- kind of information available and in numbers as well, and in a, presented in the best possible way. And, and, and people, maybe people just don't want to see it, don't want to know. But so I feel your experience is extremely encouraging. But it's a very difficult and a very subtle trade-off, isn't it? To have again that you know that short term, your short term feelings are all about mortality and they're all about survival and and in a way uh, your quality of life afterwards is secondary but there's but there's obviously a risk level at which it becomes more important so for example if your chemotherapy was incredibly damaging and toxic and only made a small impact to your survival and you were basically likely to survive anyway you might think it wasn't worth it but if you had a very low chance of survival, you just take it no matter what. But, you know. I, th- I think so that's a really a Im- interaction. Yeah. yeah, there's an important point that even if somebody doesn't want to see the numbers, at least by talking like that, you can illustrate there is a dis- choice, there is a decision, there is a point at which you would flip, and so it, it, it makes you realise that actually, uh, I think it should empower people to say, well, now I can choose on which side of that uh, of that threshold do I lie. And of course, it's about expectation and support, isn't it? I mean, the NHS and the cancer charities, it's, it's hard for them to keep supporting you for years and years afterwards, especially if you're not even undergoing any treatment. And so it's really about managing expectations. Even if you would make the same decision either way, it's about knowing that the next few years could be quite severely affected in that way. So, so just finally, I, I, something I'm always interested in as a statistician, you know, I will, I'd like to put things in numbers, but what we've been talking about today, so much of it, we're not able to put into numbers because it's to do, a lot of it's to do with fundamental lack of knowledge or you know, just we ha- our uh, ability to predict. It just isn't, isn't good enough. Um, what's the final thing? How do you feel about putting things into numbers versus putting things, giving a, a qualitative feel for how bad something might be? Hmm. Yeah, good question. I think I think hooking things on a few numbers can help. I think, I mean, one of my great kind of feelings about science communication is that it's, I, I'm a great believer in this, always possible to communicate something complicated. It's just hard. <laughs> it just takes more time to think about how to construct that in a way that is both approachable, 
but also accurate and, and has some some kind of echo or pointing towards the caveats or the simplifications that you're making. And so so it's not about a sort of numbers versus not numbers. It's about it's about almost like a, a, a two layer communication, I always feel. It's about giving those key points while not not trying to give the impression that that's all there is to the story and saying, well, it's a bit like this, or, you know, there are some other factors involved, or here's the way we can think about it, broadly speaking. And those are the kinds of phrases, but you can obviously give more specific points. I, I, and you use the word story, and I think that is absolutely the right thing. We're talking about narratives that are engaging for people and that can combine those elements of something perhaps fairly hard and numerical and a much broader perspective well i think there's been a great kind of um a, a great leap in understanding hasn't there, in the last few years that certainly in my field but lots of fields about the importance of storylines and narratives in, in because it's not just about sort of helping people to understand it's about um exploring possibilities isn't it it's imagining the future it's about putting ourselves in the place of you know this future or that future Tams and Edwards, thank you so much indeed for this wonderful conversation, which I've enjoyed a lot, and uh, I've got a huge amount out of, and I hope people listening to it will have too. So, again, Tams, thanks so much indeed. Thank you so much for having me. Risky Talk is produced by Elan Goodman at the Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication in the University of Cambridge.